If you ever wondered what the world of 1337 is going to look like in Europa Universalis 5, then you've come to the right place. This video is sponsored by War Thunder, more on that a little bit later. We're going to be using all the knowledge given to us by Johan of the Tinto people. That's right, I've gone through every single comment he ever replied to. I've gone through all of the seven current dev diaries for Project Caesar. Yeah, right, Project Caesar. Might as well just call it EU5. Am I right, Johan? And I've pieced together all the core mechanics that EU5 will have so pay close attention to this video and keep yourself glued because there's a lot of really vital important information that you might not have realized since they have been hinted at simply by Johan replying and giving away so much I mean holy mother of god this man gave away more than he gave in the dev diaries from simply replying to people <laughs> also guys if you enjoyed the content consider subscribing I'm trying to reach 200,000 subs by the end of this month and as reward I'll be doing a mega camp campaign that includes all the games from Imperator Rome till Hearts of Iron 4 and maybe even Stellaris. The main topics we'll be addressing in today's video are going to be major events at the game start, population, buildings, trade, armies and navies, and economic overview. Take note, this is considering the information that we have available right now. As more dev diaries and more comments are going to come about from Johan, we're going to find out more and this might change in the future. So let me know if you like me to update this a month later when we're going to have a at least four more dev diaries by that point and maybe it can even make this like a monthly thing for example just to keep everybody up to track with everything that's going on in development and what you need to do to chip in and make sure that uh, the project is going on the right track what are going to be the major events that will influence the gameplay in 1337 and after well i think everybody's thinking about it the most important one is going to be mega death uh the the black death the black death starting from 1346 the black Black Death slowly came over from the Asian parts, courtesy of rats infested with fleas that came along the Asian trade routes, starting off from the Horde lands and around the uh, Greek Byzantine lands, as well as the uh, western tip of the Anatolian and the Genoese lands, because remember, this was majority spread out by trade initially, and then naturally spreading all over the place once it did reach into Europe. The impact of the Black Death has been actually massive. I cannot explain in just this video how much it influenced the history of Europe. I actually was thinking to make a video, a history video on the Black Death itself. Let me know if you guys want to see that in the comment section. And if we get 3,400 likes on this video, I'll do one. Like an actual dedicated history video on it. Because this is a not so discussed topic, but a topic that influenced Europe more than the world wars from certain regards. To put it into perspective, in some countries, up to 60% of the population died. Dude, that means you had more chances of dying than not dying that means entire industries were destroyed entire technologies were lost because the people that knew how to manufacture certain goods died so they couldn't spread the knowledge or they didn't leave the knowledge of how to do those things anymore to anybody else because they all died entire armies were decimated countries that were absolutely leaders in their own little regions became overshadowed by other cultures and other countries that didn't suffer as much from the black death as they did at the very least i recommend you check out the wikipedia page if you don't want to check out the wikipedia page though i recommend the book by rosemary horrocks the black death from 1994 edition really great stuff and gives a lot more insight into the world of the 1300s which was completely ravaged by this particular epidemic the deaths are estimated between 25 to 50 million deaths in europe at the time that was around half the population if not more of the population of europe it was just horrible 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 even here it says i think yes estimated to have killed 30 to 60 percent of the european population as well as approximately 33 percent of the middle east and the reason why it's less percentage of the middle east and i know this is hard to hear for some people it's because in islamic culture there is a tradition of washing your hands and everything which is embedded in the religion itself and that actually helped the middle eastern people because you know washing means less chance of infection and so on on the other hand pretty much everybody that survived the black death in europe is a champion and in some of the major Maybe even have a little bit of immunity to it. Who's to say, right? Maybe, maybe taking only one shower a month like the English used to do. I'm just kidding. They, they, they never took a shower. Unless we count the swamps. All right, fine, fine. I'll stop peeking on the English. It was pretty much everybody in Europe, especially, that wasn't really taking showers much in the Middle Ages. <laughs> kind of like me. I don't remember the last time I took a shower. Holy shit, am I from the Middle Ages? The next thing that happened is in May 1337, the Hundred Years' War started. Now, the reason why that happened is because... 
Philip IV of France decided to claim the lands of Normandy for himself, pushing out the English and only letting the English have a small foothold in the uh, Gascon parts. However, Edward III, the king of the English, whose mama was the daughter of Philip IV, claimed the crown of France and he managed to get the support of multiple Flemish towns, the richest areas at the time. Since the Flemish were known for their production of cloth and fancy toilet paper, um, I might have made up the fancy toilet paper, but the, you cannot prove they did not make fancy toilet paper, okay? The entire economy of Belgium is based off of a lie. It's all about fancy toilet paper, really. But no, seriously though, Edward III was basically the grandkid of Philip IV. So this is a family affair, just like most European affairs were. The grandkid wanted the crown early, Papa, but Papa didn't want to give it, and actually Papa's just grandpa. Within the 1300s, and for example, in 1340, the biggest loss the French encountered was at the hands of Edward III's fleet. At the Battle of Sluis, he managed to destroy the French fleet, and then later, the same year, he commanded directly his units against Philip IV and defeated the French army, even though the English were considerably outnumbered by the French. Also, this is the first account in which cannons played a major role in European fighting. So this is in 1340. Why do we not have cannons in 1444, by the way? Since in 1340, cannons played a major role in the combat, okay? Just saying. Anyway, anyway, I, I digress. Moving a little bit to the eastern parts of uh, Europa Universalis, because despite the game being called Europa, it also includes the rest of the world. In 1368, the Yuan dynasty was reduced only to northern Yuan, which would eventually become the various Mongol tribes like the Oirats and Mongols as we have in E4. And the Ming dynasty was established by Chu Yuan Chang, which kind of begs the question, why was his name Yuan? Hmm, I wonder. The rebellion that gave birth to the Ming dynasty and the Hong Wu Emperor as he was known was honestly long due and pretty much everybody saw it coming. A thing that precipitated that though was the failed invasion of Japan by the Yuan. Again in 1368 they the Yuan dynasty tried to land in Japan and they had an army of 145,000 strong but because of a massive storm on the sea which is actually known as a kamikaze divine wind the name of the last DLC for EU3 divine wind and also the name of the Second World War fighter pilots, but we don't talk about that. Anyway, the kamikaze destroyed the entire fleet, or most of the fleet of the Mongolians, and that was the end of the Yuan dynasty. It pretty much consolidated the fact that the rebels outnumbered at this point the Yuan, since the Yuan lost most of their army in the failed attempt of invading Japan, and as such, the same year, Ming became in charge of the country, pushing the Yuan in the north of uh, China, in the Mongolian parts to be more precise. Another really important thing that happened in the 1300s is the rise of the Venetian Republic after the wars between the Venetians and the Genoese and more precisely the Battle of Chioggia the Venetians consolidated their grasp over the majority of the trade in the Mediterranean and became the greatest trade Republic La Serenissima and the ultimate naval power in Europe for basically 100 years to come after this particular battle against the Genoese I do suspect the Venetians to be one of the central figures within uh, U5 and I do expect them to be significantly strong Stronger, both from a technological perspective, a government perspective, and just opportunities. So, not sure how Paradox is going to depict that, but I highly think that Venice is going to be, if not the central figure in the Mediterranean, the up and coming central figure, since their arise came about 30 years after the actual start date of the campaign. And last but not least is going to be the great famines that have affected the 1300s, especially the great famine of 1332, which lasted up until after. 1337 in the Chinese Yuan dynasty and it killed over 6 million people just from starvation alone. This was more of a recurrent theme within the Asian plains than it was over the European plains since in Europe people were dying due to the plague a lot more than starvation albeit the plague did make it significantly harder for people to farm on the count of you know they were dead which also led to various famines starting in Europe at the same time as the plague for a good 20 to 30 years which in turn also led to a lot of deaths as well. So famine and plague should be the central themes at the start of your campaign. Now despite the Yuan dynasty of the Mongolians being on its last legs in 1337 other parts of the Mongol world namely the white blue horde of the golden horde were actually significantly strong. It took at least 150 years more until they completely got outrun by the Muscovite and various other Russian principalities. Truth be told in 1337 playing in the eastern parts of Europe is going to be extremely difficult since you're gonna have to be 
essentially, whether you like it or not, a tributary of the White Horde, the most powerful entity in the European continent by far. So I feel like the most challenging starts in 1337 are going to be in the Principality lands, Lithuania, Galicia, Volhynia, and whoever's in the Caucasus. Before we continue, big thanks to today's sponsor, War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made, available for free on PC and consoles, with over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships of 10 major nations, starting from biplanes and armored cars of the 1920s to main battle tanks and jets of today. With incredibly detailed vehicles, realistic graphics, and authentic sound effects, you can join a worldwide community of over 70 million players in epic PvP battles and an unmatched wealth of quality content to discover. Truly the ultimate gaming experience for fans of military history. I've been playing War Thunder for years now and was happy when they decided to sponsor me since I love the game as a whole. My favorite bit however is the wide range of game types. You've got arcade for fast paced matches with enhanced vehicle performance and simplified physics, simulator for the ultimate challenge and realistic which offers the middle ground good balance between intensity and authenticity. What really makes War Thunder stand out however is the sophisticated vehicle damage models. Every vehicle is intricately modeled down to its individual components such as engines, fuel tanks, crews and weapons and each can take damage or be disabled which in turn affects how your vehicle behaves afterwards. Don't miss out and use my link below to play War Thunder for free on PC or console. New and returning players that haven't played in 6 months will also receive a bonus pack that includes multiple premium vehicles and an exclusive vehicle decorator. The people in the caucus are also going to be trapped between the fall of the Ilkhanat successor so the Jairids here which are essentially the biggest of the nations that sprang out of the collapse of the uh, Ilkhanat and the other nations around here as well. Plus you also have the various Turkic Beyliks that are fighting for control with one Turkic Beylik in particular, the Ottoman Beylik, having a significant advantage over all the other Beyliks, that's for sure. I also feel like 1337 is going to be the beginning of the end for the Byzantines because a lot of historical events happened in the early 1300s that pretty much were out of the control of the Byzantines. I mentioned in my previous video the walls of Kallipoli got destroyed by an earthquake which allowed the Ottomans to rush in, capture the city and use that as a foothold to just spread around the entirety of uh, the Balkans, eventually can capturing Adrianople which became Eretna which is the version, the Turkish version of uh, Adrianople the name and it became the capital, the Balkan capital of the Ottoman Empire since in the early phase of their uh, inception they had two capitals, one in the Anatolian part and one in the Balkan part. Well, technically they kind of have the same today although unofficially Istanbul being the economic capital but the actual official capital is Ankara of Turkey, the Republic of Turkey. How many of you guys knew that, huh? I bet you all thought that Istanbul's the capital of Turkey. One thing that they mention in the Dev Diaries, the 8th Dev Diary to be more precise, is that we're going to have banking countries. A lot of them are actually going to be coming from the uh, middle, central, and northern parts of the Italian peninsula. At the time in the 1300s, the Renaissance was starting to make its way in the Italian bits. All technologies and old ways of life and new ways of life were coming about with the various small Italian uh, city-states end of the day competing with each other and that competition between one another is what actually led to innovation. One of the biggest competitions as I mentioned earlier the one between the Venetians and the Genoese over who's gonna be the ultimate seafaring potato lord and by potato lord I mean turnip lord because potatoes were not around in 1300 they were in the new world which is why it's vital for us to also mention that in the 1300s we would have the peak of the Mayan civilization this was a period of stability or relative stability and the beginning of the decline of the Central American entities with the Mayans making a very very steep and abrupt decline into pretty much non-existence by the time of uh, the uh, Spanish conquerors what was left in the Mayan lands was just uh, disunited and technologically reduced entities we don't really have too many sources on what exactly caused the decline of the Mayans and the Aztecs and everybody else in Central America because there's just very few tablets really and most of the information was written after the arrival of the uh, conquistadors since they also brought alongside with them uh, the ability to read and write you know on sheepskin or whatever they were writing on back then. I feel like Paradox can do a lot of amazing things with the Central American parts and the South American parts for that matter as well. Not sure how it's 
it's going to be portrayed, but they really should be a very interesting and different playstyle compared to the European bits. One last thing to take note of is that around 1330s, religion was significantly more fluid than it was in the 1440s, which is the EU4 start date, because we had significantly more amounts of heretical religions or just different branches of uh, Christianity, as well as we still had Romuva around, quite a few pockets of Norse and uh, Suomensko. Most of the White Horde was not yet fully converted to Sunni, just a few years prior to the start date, it started getting converted, so you still had massive pockets of Tengri and other various uh, animist and other religions. Miafusites was still around, to a certain extent, some Nestorians in the central parts of Asia, and smaller reduced communities within the Middle East as well. So I love to see religion also play a major diversifying factor in uh, EU5, as it should, right? So let's get going with the population. We have our very first view of the province interface in Europa Universalis 5 here. This is the province of Kalmar. And before we actually analyze the entire makeup of this particular image here, I'm just going to talk about the population and how you have different population amounts based on the location. Because remember, population is going to be individual for each location. That means, for example, in a place like Sundra over here, which is, again, one of the newer images released with the more recent uh, dev diary for U5. We have different provinces. So the province itself goes from Tegal all the way to Chibuyaya and it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven locations. Now these locations can be either towns, cities, or villages. So these are the three types with the village being the smallest town, the middle one, and the city the biggest. And each of these different types of locations have their own unique types of buildings. This is very similar to the Imperator Rome system where within a province you have different locations just like you have in EU5 and then the population itself is shown here separately and it has different layers of your population you have slaves tribesmen freemen citizens and nobles and also villages or settlements as they're called in Imperator Rome have buildings that revolve around your basic raw materials and your basic economy and then as you progress and you get cities like the one in Rome you have different buildings there's not much uh, focus on uh, building building up your raw materials in the cities. Instead, the purpose of cities is going to be to give different bonuses from the buildings that they have, plus the raw materials that are produced in other locations within that province are then refined within your cities by certain buildings. This has been confirmed by Johan. Certain buildings will be refining and producing other goods within that province. So within the province of Rome, as we have here, for example, you would say have seven different types of raw materials being produced or better yet we can take the actual province of Kalmar directly from the dev diaries so we have stone as the raw material produced in the location or the town of uh, Kalmar Kalmar is a location within the province of Ostrasmaland which if I'm not mistaken Ostrasmaland means uh, subscribe to Ludiet Historia in Swedish I think some of my Swedish people can confirm that obviously totally didn't just make that up but yeah that being said Kalmar is a town and it has a raw material I think and this is not confirmed but but I do think that cities also will likely have their own raw material that they're producing. Since that's something that's not going to change as you upgrade your uh, locations. But building a town or a city is likely going to give you the option to build certain specific buildings. Which allow you to process the raw materials from that province. Or even process the materials from the entire market for that matter. Because Johan says in the comment section to the latest Tinto Talks. When he answers. Lambert's question that cloth is not a raw material and will be talked about next week. So he basically mentions that, well, he confirms that there's going to be other materials that will be produced within your provinces that are not going to be the raw material that we have in this particular image over here. So we can probably expect a system like we have in Mayo and Taxes or other mods for Europa Universalis 4 in which buildings will influence the direction of your province. So you maybe you'll be able to get wool as a raw material and then use that wool to make cloth and then make use that cloth to make tunics for the soldiers or something of the sorts is just a suggestion or I hope that's going to be the case in fact I'm a big advocate of um, needing to have weapons built and armors built for your soldiers in order to recruit them there I said it I think it makes no sense for you not to have a proper production required to hire units just pressing a button and spending some ducats to get a unit and then in return 
turn where is that armor coming from where is that uh, weapon coming from you know what i mean is it coming from the ether since they're taking so much time here and in this dev diary johan actually mentions that he's not a fan of the ether invisible location from where stuff comes from and that's why the loan system is completely different in uh, in uh, europa universalis 5 i strongly suspect that we might have some basic mechanic of needing to build military uh, supplies in order to recruit units now let's go back to the population and talk a little bit about that i'm also going to use the latest dev diary because it's easier to illustrate this way there's going to be at the very least as it stands right now four different layers of your society there's going to be the nobles the clerics the burghers and the peasants i'm assuming the peasants is also going to include the slaves so it's going to be peasants and slaves or maybe slaves are going to be a different layer of society i don't know yet but this is what we know so far that the population that you have is going to be individually represented within every single location and you're going to be able to set up different tax rates on all of them so for example here you see that base tax explained for the province of kalmar and you can see the tax rate is different for each layer of society so you've got nobles taxed at a 15 percent burgers taxed at 25 bondes tandet which i'm assuming stands for the regular peasantry is at 25 percent and the clergy at zero that's a recurrent theme actually the clergy in most countries especially catholic nations is going to be zero taxation actually muslim nations too for that matter probably everybody's not going to be taxing the clergy much in this game we're going to come back to this image too when we explain the economic part of uh, eu5 as we know of it right now but until that point we need to finish the topic of population because it's really important population is going to play one of the major roles in eu5 so population is going to directly influence the power that your various estates are going to have in your country and not only that johan again mentioned in the comments section that population directly affects your soldiers so whenever you lose units in combat it lowers your actual population and remember that we're going to have two types of units we're going to have levies and we're going to have standing armies so when you make an army that is basically levies the consequence is going to be you're going to have a bigger army that's not trained and easier to lose units and as such you're going to be lowering your population faster and losing a lot of money and your economy is going to go down in the process of course your country is going to suffer in the process johan also mentioned in the comment section again that plagues and famines are going to be one of the biggest issues you're going to be dealing with that means that you need to be able to sustain your economy to have enough food to feed everybody in your country and i'm assuming that excess food is also going to lead to a boost in population a growth in population as was historic one of the reasons that we are so many billions today is because of the industrial revolution which also revolutionized the agriculture industry and as such you know it allowed for more food to be produced which led to more people being able to be fed right so obviously a direct result of that would make sense for excess food in provinces to cause more population to be uh, spawning in right because that's totally what humans do they spawn in uh, they spawn in new humans i know that for for sure now let's talk a little bit more about the buildings as we've discussed population or at least what we know about it so far buildings are going to play a major role in uh, u5 and there's going to be tons of buildings we don't know exactly what right now some of them have been actually explained by uh, johan for example we're going to have a roads and you can actually see on the map itself right here that is a road and roads are going to increase control control what is control control is kind of similar to autonomy how it works in u4 in the sense that control is going to be a system where it decides how much of a province you're going to be able to uh, take advantage of having 100 percent control means you can get 100 percent of the tax 100 percent of the trade 100 percent of the levies 100 percent of the manpower from that province having 50 percent control means you're going to get 50 percent of everything having 70 percent control means you're going to get 70 percent of everything and there's going to be certain buildings that will increase your control your starting capital is going to have a hundred percent control always and then as you build roads from your capital it will increase control we know that how well look at this province here stockholm is clearly the capital it has roads leading up around stockholm and every single province that is adjacent to Pro stockholm that has roads in it has a lighter shade of green indicating more control compared to the one province here which doesn't have a road and as such it has less control so that's how i confirmed that roads are going to increase control okay there you go debunked we know one of the ways of increasing control also johan mentioned it in the comment section but that's aside from the point i figured it out from here first okay don't worry about it another thing that johan mentions in this particular dev diary is that a bailiff is going to be a building that we're going to be able to build and that's also going to help out with control and a few other things we're likely going to be expecting production and trade buildings and taxation buildings 
buildings. Also, Johan mentioned in the comment section for this dev diary that there's going to be no particular limit, hard limit on buildings. It's going to be more about how much you can afford to build and whether it's going to be viable or not. So it's a different system from previous games, that's for sure. A little bit more akin to Imperator Rome, kind of, because Imperator also has limits, to be fair. Or better yet, more similar to Victoria 3, I guess you could say. And considering what we talked about earlier from the last dev diary, we do know that there's going to be buildings that will allow production of certain trade goods by using raw materials. One more thing to note is that, and this is really important, by the way, in the last dev diary he mentions, well, he doesn't so much mention as he illustrates the fact that during construction, it will require access to the following goods in the Riga market, 0.1 lumber, 0.0, .0 available in market. What does that mean? Well, it means that without even saying, Johan gave away the fact that building buildings within your province is going to require raw materials. So in this case, expanding the mine in Kalmar is going to provide 1000 more jobs for your uh, peasants or slaves. And that's going to produce 0.7 ducats worth more of stone, one unit of stone to be more precise in that particular province. And building that mine is going to require lumber. If you don't have that lumber available in the market, you're not going to be able to build that particular good. So it's likely that if everybody's building at the same time and there's limited amounts of uh, lumber or whatever other trade goods we might need in order to upgrade a building, then you're going to have to wait until that good is available. So we might have to have a queue or something of the sorts. That means that it's likely lumber provinces are going to be your first priority for upgrade. So you have the lumber necessary to expand your industry as you progress in the campaign. We also see a uh, placeholder right now, 44.45 ducats in, in 180 days to expand the Colmar mines. This might not be permanent. We don't know what the actual value is going to be when the game is released or what the amount of time is going to be. But I, uh, it's fair to say that it's likely going to be around 180 days or so and around 44 or 50 ducats considering all the other values we've seen so far. Now, every time you upgrade your mines or you upgrade your farms or whatever the sorts, because remember, your raw material can also be grain, lumber, fish, anything of the sort. So you upgrade your fisheries or whatever the hell it might be called. Who's to say, right? Every level when you upgrade it provides one flat of that particular trade goods, as is the case here with stone. One stone is 0.7 ducats at that particular time when the screenshot was taken. It couldn't go up. It can go down from two stone. You're going to get 1.4 ducats in the Rigar market. That doesn't mean that you're going to directly get 0.7 ducats instantly once you've upgraded that particular raw good. That's not how it works. So as is explained, you will be getting a percentage of that based on the amount of control that you have within the Rigar market. So if you have 100% control on the Riga market, sure. But if you have 2% control of the Riga market, you get 2%. But building up that particular of mine is going to also give jobs and as such is going to give some sort of taxation income. We don't know exactly how it works right now. But from what I understand is based on the control that you have in each province individually. So if the base tax is 0.42, but you control only 56%, you only have access to 56% of 0.42, which is like 0.21. 0.22 I don't know I'm not good with mathematics and then that's broken down again on the tax rate so that's the potential amount that you would be getting if you were taxing everybody at 100% but you're not taxing everybody at 100% for example the burgers only get 25% peasants 25 nobility 15% tax so your actual income from the province or the location of uh, Kalmar would be 0.05 ducats that's it at least as it shows from this particular image so if say you had 100% control and and you were taxing everybody at 100%, then sure, you would be getting the maximum amount, which would be 0.76 tax from Kalmar. But remember, you likely will have trade income aside from tax income. Trade income is based directly on the amount of the share that you have in the particular trade market. So if you have a big share in the Riga market, you're going to get a lot of trade income. If you have a small share, you're going to get less and as such. And to point out here, 56 is the current control. 58 is the control equilibrium as it would be in EU4 terms, meaning the potential to reach 58%. Slowly, the control is going to be taking towards whatever the equilibrium is at, which right now is at 58% in the province of Kalmar in this particular example. Also very vital to take from this particular uh, dev diary is that, as Johan says, we talked about raw materials and resource gathering operations. Every location has one raw material possible that can be extracted. This includes things like lumber, stone, grain, amber, copper, and E4 virgins. Of course, there are other ways to get access to raw materials than merely owning 
and controlling a location so that means that it's likely you're going to be able to get materials from trade so if you don't have a particular material in your market you don't have it being produced in your country that is you're going to be able to import it from the market we already know and is explained already above that and in previous dev diaries as well that food is going to be one of the things that will be imported if it's required in your provinces and we see in the economic screen here for the previous dev diary buying food is going to cost 2.15 ducats for the swedes at the start of the campaign as it stands right now again these are not final values that's because the swedes have dog shit farms and they need to build more farms clearly farming meta is going to be a meta for sure let's see also take note only peasants and slaves will work on gathering raw materials and how many will work depends on how big of an inf infrastructure you have built up for that pops that are working with this will not be producing food unless the goods are food related so that means that aside from uh, pops that are extracting raw materials there's going to be separate pops probably also peasants and slaves that will be producing food alongside whatever other raw resources you have but the exception to that is if your raw raw good in that particular province is grain then you're going to be producing grain from the infrastructure which is likely going to be its own trade good as well as a source of food and the ones that are not employed are basically just producing food on their own also to note maximum size of infrastructure can be built up depending on population development technologies and societal values i'm guessing depending on population is really important because for example certain parts of the world like the chinese the indian parts they're going to have really massive population and having that dependent on population should be a thing or you know china is going to collapse really can you also give a big shout out to old sealand here for the most awesome freaking meme in the entirety of the dev diaries he clearly discovered that tinto talks is really just johan talks because so far we've only seen johan talking that's pretty accurate really up next let's talk a little bit about trade now i'm not gonna go through every single one of the comments and show them in the video because there's been a few here and there and i've written down my notes in my notepad over here before i started recording the video everything that i'm supposed to talk about when it comes to trade trade is really really crucial in eu5 guys it's going to be one of the main sources of income for most nations and some nations are going to be dedicated trade republics just like some nations are going to be dedicated banking city states that's another thing that you should know now i think that was the last or second last dev diary where he mentions certain city states that are going to be essentially banks first off i'm going to get this out of the way trade is going to be fluid it's not going to be a static wind direction it's going left it's going right and there's a end trade node that's not how it's going to work trade in eu5 is going to be a fluid dynamic mechanic the way that i personally envision this and uh i don't know if i'm allowed to say this but let's just say that i know from a good source that the way that i've explained it in my previous video and the way that i'm going to be explaining it again today is pretty much the most accurate way it's going to be in eu5 way above anybody else's uh, expectations and anybody else's assumptions so far let's just say that trade is going to be going in all directions it's going to be all over the map and it's going to be represented by the carts that are going to deliver trade on the land routes it's going to be represented by the ships that are going to be delivering trade via shipping lanes and the best part guys and this is confirmed from the previous dev diary and also from the comment section you're going to be able to stop trade so when you go to war with another nation you're going to be physically able to position your soldiers in a trade route to prevent trade from happening through that route so nations are going to have to reroute trade around your nation or around your armies or around the sea tiles because you're also going to be able to block trade with your ships and blocking trade is going to be one of the most efficient ways of destroying your enemy because remember if your enemy is not able to get the food it requires for its population by trading for that food if it cannot produce it locally then they're gonna starve out so you can essentially not even attack the enemy uh, forts you just starve out the entire country by blocking off their country completely surrounding them surrounding all their trade lanes all their trade routes blockading them completely or you're gonna stop their development if they need certain resources to build their buildings and develop their country or to make weapons who's to say this by the way is my assumption we don't have a confirmation that there's gonna be a weapon making mechanic keep that in mind and here's another sneak peek that uh, confirms what I'm 
saying here. One of the earlier dev diaries, Johan says, there are land locations that cannot be settled by anyone but can still be traversed by armies with insanely high attrition or allow trade to pass through. This little phrase here basically made me realize that trade is going to be a fluid thing that literally you can see on the map and that you can divert and that you can work with essentially. I feel like trade is going to go from one of the worst features in a Europa Universalis franchise to one of the best features in Europa Universalis franchise. And that is thanks to all of you guys, especially the ones that have been nagging Paradox on the forums about how bad trade is in, current, uh, in the current game in EO4. And I actually fully agree. The whole trade system in EO4 is horrible and it's extremely exploitable and just not fun. So I'm glad to see that they're going down with this particular path for trade. Now let's go ahead and talk about armies and uh, navies, what we know about it. Not so much. We also can talk about this little passage here. It's going to allow armies to traverse, but with insanely high attrition. We do know that there's going to be attrition in uh, EU5, but attrition is likely going to be different. We don't have the supply dev diary just yet. It's going to come out in a couple of weeks, I, I, I suspect. But we do know that it's going to be either similar to Imperator Rome, where you have certain mules that take supplies with the armies. And then when you traverse deserts, it's going to consume the supply a lot faster. And then your army actually starts dying off when you do not have food for your troops. So essentially something like this, you have the armies and you have two supply trains here. These supply trains can hold up to 155 food and the food goes down or up every month based on whether they are in friendly or enemy terrain or better yet, whether there is food available to replenish because you can be in friendly terrain, but you don't have food in that particular province. Say this province here only has 1,400 food. They have food. Let me find one that doesn't have food actually. They have food everywhere. Come on, seriously. Okay, look at this one. This has less food. 500 only out of 900. So if this one, let's hypothetically say had zero food, then uh, the army would not be replenishing even though it had the supply trains because it wouldn't be able to take any of that food for itself. So I'm assuming this is going to be similar in uh, EU5. It's a great system. I feel like this is the best depiction of a medieval and early renaissance supply train or supply system better yet. And I really hope that it's going to make its way to EU5 personally. Now we also know there's going to be levies at the start of the campaign. And the way that it's going to work is there's going to be 100 units in every single brigade, battalion, whatever they're going to be called division. We don't know. Probably not division since it's 100. Probably like something like Red Tenny or something of the source like CK3. That has been confirmed by Johan in the second to last div diary in the comment section again. And at the start of the campaign, almost everybody's going to have a few hundred standing soldiers with majority of the army going to be levies. As you progress and the bigger your economy gets, the more modern your country gets, the more standing armies you're going to have alongside the levies. Of course, levies are likely going to be sticking around for the entirety of EU4, but recruiting levies or mustering levies later in the campaign is going to be significantly more costly as it's going to damage your population, it's going to damage your output, and it's just not going to be efficient when middle to late game EU5 armies are going to be significantly stronger, the standing armies are going to be significantly stronger than the actual levies are going to be, right? Now, we don't know if armies are going to be supplied with weapons and armors, but I really do hope so, honestly. And a little small addendum, we have confirmation that we're going to have ships built, actual physical ships that you're going to need to build. So it's not going to be the CK3 system where there's an imaginary ship that pops out for a certain amount of money when you send the army on the sea tile. That's not going to be the case. We're actually going to have ships, physical ones that you're going to be able to move around on the map as you want to move them around the map. Also, before I finish this off, I want to mention about loans because this is really cool, actually. Loans at a default are going to be at 10% interest and you're going to be able to take loans from both your estates and from other loan countries. So that means banking city states, as I was saying earlier, like Peruzzi and Bardi, for example, which are banking countries. Not paying off your banking country loans is going to result in you not getting any loans from them ever again in your campaign. And the amount of loans you can take from your estates is based on the amount of money they have saved up. It's not going to be an infinite amount of, amount of loans that you're going to be able to take from your estates. I hope you guys enjoyed this little overview today. Don't forget to also subscribe so we can uh, possibly reach our sub goal. And big thanks to War Thunder once more for sponsoring today's video. Use my link below to grab the massive bonus back across all platforms, limited offers, so don't miss out. And I want to give a massive thank you to all of my patrons, channel members, and Twitch subscribers. I would not be able to do this without all your support.